you think the allure of this character is because, listen, because of your voice and personality and your charisma, you've made this character not only horrifying, but you made him sexy. You know, have you found that a lot of women are attracted to Candyman, even though he's a horror character? Too many. <laughs> <laughs> and for all the wrong reasons, okay? Everyone, how you doing? Corey here again in the middle of the day. You know, if I'm here in the middle of the day and not at night when we usually do our shows, that means that we have somebody very special here today. And you're going to have to forgive me if I'm a little giddy right now because the guest that we have here, I've admired this person, been a huge fan for many, many, many years, ever since I was a young teenager. And now I have him here today. Doesn't really need any introduction, and we'll learn more about him as we go along with this interview. But please welcome everyone, Mr. Tony Todd. Tony, how are you doing? I'm wonderful today. It's another blessed moment and uh, belated happy 2022 to everybody out there who hasn't paid, paid attention at the time or the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> well, the same to you, too. And you know what? I appreciate you being here because you were supposed to be here last week. You, you had a flu shot. I know everybody's going through it right now. So you know I hope you're feeling I'm better. sure I got both vaccines. I'm double vaccinated. I'm double boosted. And I take my flu shots because I believe in working. And I believe in, like, being unified and making sure that we're all on the same page so we can get to the next chapter together. So let me come out there and slap somebody. Okay? <laughs> I'm surprised. Uh, COVID, I mean, just, we're going to the third year now. Let's get real, folks. Let's get on the same page. Of course. Uh, you know what? I affect my bottom line, okay? When you affect the bottom line from a brother from Hartford, Connecticut, you fucking with multitudes. <laughs> Well, this is going to be a good talk here today, man. I'm surprised the flu would even want to mess with you. <laughs> well, you know, I can kick a lot of ass, but sometimes, you know, people being out of control and not paying attention to the attending super spreaders and then thinking that it is not going to touch, doesn't touch. Folks, wake up. But that, well, that's not what we're here for today, but still, wake up. Thank you so much, man. If you know, if you ain't listening to me and not everybody else, maybe you listen to Tony Todd, who you should listen to. The man is, he looks kind of tough to me, so take <laughs> heed, y'all. But, you know what? Well, we'll get through this together, folks. I didn't mean to lay anything heavy on people. Seriously, it's the third year now. Do we want our life to continue? I personally love to travel. I miss Paris. I miss Africa. I miss Europe. And I'm ready to get, you know, to see something besides me. Sort of jack in the box. <laughs> well, I'm sure you know what uh, you'll be getting back out there because you do stay working, man. You know the thing is. It, well, I was. I had a great run going. Now I got like uh, what do we got? Four, four postponed projects. You know, uh, we were going to be working right at the beginning of this year, but we got four things postponed. We're waiting for everything to sort itself out. Four things you know, postponed. What was so? Can you? name any of those things that were postponed like what was the one that you were looking forward to the most uh all of them uh the, no there's some things that are deep in contractual things i mean you know it's gonna be some surprises for folks this year i think uh but uh, you know i'm connected to a couple of video games a couple of films uh got two plays on the docket that i wanted to do both this wilson plays one jitney mm -hmm. the st louis film uh, st louis black repertory company and Fences at the Pennsylvania Shakespeare Festival. So those are two that look in pretty precariously right now. I know they're not into June, May and June, but the way things are going, you know, we were hoping to invite people back for full theater. I got so many active friends in New York that shows are canceling left and right. Fortunately, they're not being officially ended, but like, you never know, you're performing, you show up in half hour, you're ready to do your job, and all of a sudden, you're canceled. And now producers are asking for a 50% pay cut. But I'm a union person. This is in a union moment. So I'm not going to get that. Don't fall for that, folks. You know, it's not your fault. So producers are asking for a 50% pay cut. Why is yeah, that? The producers, you know, because they're suffering. Because every, like, we had a show, uh, Moment of Rouge, for example, two weeks ago, one of the top shows on Broadway. Five minutes before the curtain came up, they canceled the show. So right up to curtain time, people were living with an unprecedented, unparalleled amount of tension and paranoia that doesn't belong anywhere in the creative process. 
Has, the other one, you're trying to go for a job, then you can be as tense as you want, go kick ass. You know, this is interesting to hear because a lot of people, when they look at actors, you know, it looks very glamorous, of course. You know, you're larger than life to people. But this is, very, this is very interesting to hear because, you know, a lot of people take for granted that, you know, actors, what they do is a job. And if you're not working, you're missing out on money. You know, it, it takes a reminder like this to let people know. Yeah, but I mean, I've been fortunate. I mean, I've, you know, I've been working for 30 years, so I've been smart. You know, my daughter's went to both Wesleyan and Columbia, and uh, she's doing great. Her birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday, Ariana. Um, you know, you got to be smart. You know, you, most actors, though, when they get their first job, they tend to spend the first five gigs, you know, and uh, now is not the time to do that. For every dollar you make, save a buck, you know. Yeah, so, or Clinton numbers at least. You know what? This is uh, good to hear for a lot of creatives out there and people who are going into a creative field, you know, how to be smart about your money. What are, so with your money, you say you've been smart and you've been smart at your business. What is what are some of the things you could tell people or advice you would give to people to be smart and invest their money wisely when they're doing this? Well, when I was a kid, I grew up in New England, Hartford, Connecticut specifically, and I remember I couldn't wait for the snow to fall because I organized a little crew and I was smart enough to be a supervisor. I wasn't out there breaking my back, but I had a crew out there and then we all meet at the, the donut and cocoa shop. <laughs> Whatever it is. But even then when I had that job, for every dollar I made, I put a quarter of my savings back and I still do that religiously. Um, and then fortunately, you know, when you become a working actor, you live on residuals, which are the peripheral benefits that we receive for projects that, you know, that are profitable and then, uh, you know, pension and, and, uh, and uh, you know, and just spreading goodwill, man. I, I found that uh, making somebody smile actually puts more interest in your bank account than actually waiting for that dividend. It's funny hearing uh, this come from you telling, you know, people uh, to make someone smile when you've made most of your career scaring the shit out of people. <laughs> we can't even well, make them. Well, that's movies, man. <laughs> I used movies, to watch I it in New York for three years. I was a very prolific bartender. Um, you know, nobody, I, I went to school for this stuff. I mean, I went to Trinity Rep, Jane O'Neill Theater Center before that. I got my master's in theater. Nobody at the time, wasn't like I was in school saying, you know what, I want to only do movies to scare people to death. No, this is the luck of the draws that happened when I got out. Mm -hmm. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm happy for it. There's certain goals that people will remember forever, and that makes me happy. Uh, but there's also, you never know the depth of a man until you see inside of his soul, you know? So I've got a lot of life history stored up, and whenever I get too annoyed by the limitations of roles that would be offered to me cinematically, I can always go back to the theater, which is my first love and will always be my perpetual love. Is that how it is for a lot August of actors? I'm, oh, I'm sorry, repeat that? August Wilson, the best African-American playwright to ever cross the boards. Mm -hmm. actor, make sure you have an August Wilson monologue in your back pocket. Is that what a lot of actors do now? Are they, especially during this time, are they going? Do you see a lot of actors going back to the theater? No, because unfortunately, this time most theaters had to shut down. You know, I mean, I did a play at the Pennsylvania Shakespeare Festival last summer. Uh, it was a 450 seat theater, but because of COVID restrictions, everybody had to be masked except for me. It was a one man show. <laughs> How I learned what I learned by Alex Wilson, uh, but we only had 125 seats available, and that was fine because. Nobody had been on stage for like a year and a half, so it was very liberating. But at the same time, we need to get back to full capacity. We are missing an entire generation of young students who are in training programs. You cannot train via Zoom. I'm a teacher, so I know what I'm talking about. It has to be one-on-one. -on -one. It has to be face-to-face. -face. You have to be able to plumb the depths of your soul and connect to the actor opposite you. If you don't have that, so I worry about the future of... Uh, of cinematic and theatrical and TV presentation because we have people out there that are, I don't want to say fully trained, but they haven't received the complete benefit of what studying the art can be about, working one-on-one, -on -one, playing the bongos in somebody's apartment on Riverton Avenue, 
just connecting, going to see live theater, and feeling out what it is you want to do and how you can make your contribution to this wonderful art craft, you know? Yeah. And then that allows us to make independent films, right? Like uh, the reenactment. Yeah, which I'm yeah. Proud to be a part of. You know, this is what I was going to ask you about. You know, you talk about how you had these projects postponed, but you've done so much work and you continue to do so much work that you still have movies coming out right now. You know, like, yeah, like that, the reenactment. Yeah, that's good. But I, but I know when I know the expiration date on these things. I'm about the new man. I'm about the new. We got, <laughs> we got four films that we're trying to sort out this year. You know, and a couple other surprises. One of which I cannot talk about because. It's in the early stages of contract, but it's going to be a total surprise for all those uh, demented fans out there. Oh, demented fans. It's another hard project at least, right? <laughs> well, not necessarily. You know, sometimes horror involves true light. Right? Ah, okay. The most horrific things is like when you wake up and you see people get off when you know damn well they're guilty or you see another injustice. Or, ah, okay. Or that, we can sort through anything. You know, you have such a passion for for what you do, and definitely, you know, ever since we got on to this this this, this call and this interview, you've been dropping a lot of wisdom. Uh, are you an instructor also? Have you taught drama class, uh, acting classes? Yeah, when I I got my master's in theater, so I went returned to my hometown of Hyper, Connecticut, and I taught what they call the incorrigible students. They weren't incorrigible to me. They came every day, Monday through Friday, four hours every day. Nobody missed a single moment. And they ended up getting a mayor's uh, recommendation, accommodation. And then recently, I've been doing a tour of the historical black colleges. And I started with Hampton U. I'm supposed to do something at Clark this year. We did something at Boston College. So, yeah, that's something that's, as I uh, get wiser and older, you know, I, I love to work one on one with young talent and help them navigate not only the beauty of this business, but also the landmines of this business, how to avoid uh, destitution, how to keep your mental stability, how to keep your joy, because you cannot act unless you have an enormous capacity for joy inside of you. Of course, of course. You know, I. You know, when you talk about how you you tell people how to navigate through this business, as well as how to, you know, love this business. So you've been in, speaking of this business, you've been in, you've been acting for, let's say, a long time, you know, for people who follow you. You know, you're one of those people who, you've been in the game so long that people just always just assume you were there. It, it took me by surprise to, to know that you were, because I've seen uh, uh, Platoon several times. I forgot that you were in Platoon, man. You know, I hadn't seen it in a long That's time. Great. That was my first film. Thank you, Oliver Stone. Thank you for a great cast. Uh, we just hit the ground running, you know. But before that, what people don't know is I was a bartender in New York for three years at the theater bar, West Bank Theater Bar, mm -hmm. 40, the 43rd and 9th. I'll never forget it. My boy Louis Black was the <laughs> comedian in charge, me and him. Some days, Tuesday nights, it'd be just me and him and maybe five local people in the audience. But uh, all those are the building blocks, you know. I tell young students, every encounter that you go through is a building block in terms of your creative DNA. And mm. you got to know how to accept it, cherish it, polish it, and let it out. Man, let me know when you, when you do a class. I mean, I'm not even trying to be an actor. I just want to come and hear you talk. Why not? Man. You know. <laughs> we all have something to say. We all have something unique that is a special part, particularly as African-Americans, okay? Yeah. Look, you trace the history of how we got here, what we went through, what we're still struggling with, the economic depravity that, that affects total communities, and uh, there's a talent inside that cannot be diminished. That's why we've been so successful in the recording business, screen business, physical business, football, basketball. You know, they know, you should know that you are a gem, so polish it. Man, you got me feeling good. You got me feeling actually good. Good. <laughs> good. I woke up today, I couldn't find my wallet. And I know ain't nobody been over here. So when I finish this, I think I got to dive under my covers and dig in my couch so I can go to get some uh, 
get some grabs for the rest of the week. No, no, no. You boosted my confidence after this talk, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this hasn't been an interview. This has been an inspirational speech right here, man. Um, uh, you know, you got me on the right side of the bed this morning. It's all good. Don't, don't definitely don't want to catch you on the wrong side. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> but you know, obviously talking to you, you, you are a black man in acting. You have done stuff in Hollywood. Talking to you, you can definitely tell that you demand respect, but how has it been being a black male working in Hollywood? Uh, well, maybe not as difficult. That's in peace to the great Sidney Poitier, who at his time, you know, he was the only one of any uh, that looked remotely like him on any, any set. When I first started working, uh, aside from six black actors in there, but most of the time, you'd be the only one on the set. When I first started, you know, I look around and see 100 people on the crew, uh, nobody black. Uh, usually they only hire one of us to be in the show. Mm -hmm. Only one person black. Lately, it's been changing. Thank God. We got more and more story avenues out there due to the advent of, of, you know, streaming, Amazon, Hulu, all of the streaming platforms. So there's more. I tell all these young students, do not despair because you cannot be successful with a, a minutia of fear that will eat you up and gobble. You have to demonstrate your strength. So just know that there's more opportunities now than ever before in the history of Hollywood. Do your study, find out who your inner strength is, who you are, know who you are before you walk in the room. Don't try to compromise and make yourself into somebody that they want. Just be yourself and the jobs will come to you. No wonder no one missed your class, man. You were full of charisma and inspiration. I tell you, I would be at that class Just every wait day. Just until I find my wallet. I'm going to be even more full. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me call you then say, at that time, too. Cat, and this cat plays with everything. I called him this morning playing with a battery. If I find out that he's stooped my wallet under the couch somewhere, we'll be pissed off. <laughs> no cat food for you this week. Well, you know what? I would be remiss to not talk about one of your most memorable roles. Speaking of charisma, uh, Candyman, iconic role mm. in horror. You know, I, got, I want to ask you, since I have you here, because the thing about Candyman that I think is, the, is a big draw is that you're not, a, a, like a, a, you're not like a voiceless slasher running around. You know, you, you no, talk. No, not at all. We, didn't, we did never wanted to be that. I had no interest in being that. I got other people to do that. I, I, I see, you know, horror has always had a kind of a bastard relationship in, in the success of Hollywood. People look down on the medium and mm -hmm. mostly because there's a lot of bad horror out there where you all, you know, people think the common denominator is young teenagers slipping away, going to camp in some fucking demented motivationless monster following and chasing after great horror. Well, I'm not even going to say my film, but there's other films, Pride of Frankenstein, Nightmare Alley, that are great to have a beginning, middle, and end, have a complete story, and audiences can walk away with some sense of value. I think when Candyman hit, it was the first time you saw a black man that wasn't scarred, that was, you know, totally tall, competent, regal, king-like, and... Uh, that had been lynched, and if that's the original sin in the horror community, he was lynched. He was an artist who was deprived of his capacity, okay? Kind of like most African-American males that are yeah. stuck in a, in a repressive environment. So, you know, unfortunately, Candyman resonated not just for African-Americans, but for people worldwide because they saw a different kind of horror film. Thank you, Philip Glass. Thank you, Clive Becker. And thank you, my dear friend, Bernard Rose. He was so brilliant. He and I just did another film called Traveling Light. Uh, the fighting for distribution right now. It is um, his one of his singular masterpieces. I'm proud to be a part of it. Nice. Well, I can't wait to to see that. You know, you talk about how regal Candyman is, and of course, a lot of that has to do with your voice, your charisma. And you know what I want to ask you? Do you think the allure of this character is because listen? Because of your voice and personality and your charisma, you've made this character not only horrifying, but you made him sexy. You know, have you found that a lot of women are attracted to Candyman, even though he's a horror character? Too many. <laughs> and for all the wrong reasons. 
Okay, but you know, I keep it real. Uh, Candyman is one of my many schizophrenic characters running around in my <laughs> brain. Mm. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, an old actor a friend of mine early on, Fritz Weaver, he says, you know, to ever get too high, never get too low. If you learn how to ride a bus, you can learn how to navigate to a subway to get from place to place. Well, all of a sudden, you want to chuck that away and spend a hundred times more on a limo to go five blocks. You know, so <laughs> keep it real. You remember where you come from. Take care of your family. Try to teach other people that look like you respect and self-respect and not taking the negative path out, the easy way out, which will only end up putting you in prison somewhere. You know, and just hold your head high. There's a reason that they are trying to eliminate our voting privileges. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why they are so intimidated by people that look like me. Okay, so just know that you're part of the native indigenous and that you have my life-changing experience when, when I went to Africa for my son. I've been fortunate to film there four times. Richard Pryor once said in one of the routines, once you go there, your mindset will never be the same. You will never call another man of color the N-word again. Wow. So you, how, do you go to Africa frequently? I've been there, blessed to be there five times. Five times. Um, and every time it's been a, a monumental moment in my life where I needed to be there. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, why do you, you say you needed to be there? What was it? Was there something going on at that moment where going to Africa um, just put you in the right state of mind? It just comes when it's right. The last time I was there, I was coming off. I had a battle chemotherapy about four years ago. Thank oh. God I'm surviving that. But that was the last time God sent me there and I had to be there and I had to see the animals. I had to smell the freedom. I had to, to just, you know, touch the roses. Um, <laughs> You know, we grew up in America where everything is, I'm talking specifically now as an African-American man, so don't feel excluded out there if you're not that. But we grew up in a society where you look at a piece of coin and every face on it is something that doesn't look like you. Every single piece of money, every flag that you are trained to salute, and then you realize that this is a country that doesn't completely support you. So in Africa, it's completely reversed. Every piece of money as a black man, not only a black man, but a strong, proud, dignified black man, everything is completely reversed. So I think every American should put themselves in a position where they are in a minority in a different country, and then you'll understand more what true equality mm -hmm. should feel like. Would you ever, I know you, this is going to be a weird question, but you, you're talking about what's going on in America right now and also talking about going to visit Africa. Uh, you're very socially conscious. Uh, do you, with what's going on right now, do you have a desire to live in another country or would you like to stay here? Uh, this is my home, right? This is where I was mm -hmm. raised, better than worse. I remember the night Martin Luther King got assassinated and I wanted to go outside and so bad. The woman that raised me, go ahead, Clara, rest in peace. Uh, this is her right here. Uh, she wouldn't let me go out. It was the last physical encounter I've had with her. And I thank God, she probably saved my life that night. Hmm. So, you know, everything happens for a reason. I had a, a couple of uncles who were gamblers. They said, boy, you know, you got to take the cause you're dealt with. And if you don't have the cause that are right, you got to act like you got them. <laughs> <laughs> Which means act like you got some sense, huh? So, you I have some smart uncles, man. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, I, I, and I read about your aunt. It's, it's it's really actually very cool to hear about you talk about your family and how, you know, not only your aunt but a lot of your family had a impact on you. Wow, she raised you since yeah. you were three, right? Huh? Yeah, she rescued me when I was three years old, um, and and never. She was a domestic, and for those of you that don't know what a domestic is, it's somebody that goes to other people's houses and cleans up the stuff that those people don't want to touch themselves, right? She did that every day. I didn't realize I was poor until maybe 13, <laughs> and uh, because that's the kind of strong woman she was, and we need strong women like that, particularly, well, I'm not going to, you know, we all need strong women figures to give us sensitivity, to give us a a greater understanding of the complexity of the world. Right? So without her, she was my angel, you know, so don't thank me. Thank all the Ed Clarence of the world. For... 
it's wonderful to actually talk to somebody because we could talk about you know all the acting roles that you've done and you know and, all, and of course and you've done many again iconic roles but it's really great to talk to somebody who again is socially conscious and also politically conscious and with everything that's going on today again going back to what's happening in america we are at a moment where they're actively trying to bury our history you know the whole critical oh, race theory that cancel culture i never heard of such a thing in my life okay okay <laughs> oh, i even pick out books from school that depict the total history of what has happened in america you can't run away from this folks it's like what happened yeah if you haven't read claude brown's man child the promised land if that's not available to your library so a young black kid can see what it's like to we only go through the or Malcolm, the autobiography of Malcolm X with a spook that sat by the door and not know what it was like in the early 60s before you got here. Okay, <laughs> what people had to go through when they had to sit on the back of the bus and you don't know the whole story. It's all of America. You don't be ashamed of canceling shit. Just accept it. But anyway, I just got money on my mind, man. I got to find my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I hear you, man. But I know we were supposed to talk about the reenactment. Thank you, Andrew. You did well. Megan, you're wonderful. Steve, you're great in it. Uh, I hope people check out this film and like it. And there's a secret this character that played. Who knows what could happen to this guy? You know what? Uh, I know you have to go find your wallet. I'm going to let you do that because, you know, cause I know. <laughs> I, want it, and I want all the people out there, if you put it in my wallet and don't send it back to me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, pity the man who actually finds that wallet. I hate to be the one to return it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, that, that, I got a little bomb in that stuff. You know, <laughs> well, you know what? Before I let you go, because, again, this has been very cool just having you just take over the interview and just talk very passionately about what you, you know, how you feel about everything from your craft today, to your life. This is how I feel today. I don't know what I'm going to feel like tomorrow. Well, glad I caught you today day. then because tomorrow I don't know what I would have got. A lot of people <laughs> see this and they're like, damn, Tony kind of scaring the hell out of me right now. This is not anything I want to ask you. This is just something I want to show people out there. Two things before you go, and I want to show people. I want to show people like the happy, gentle, carefree side of Tony Ty. Uh, I, to answer a lot of people out there, and do you, I'm sure you remember this commercial, because I had to look at this a few times. Is that Tony Todd? Is that Candyman? Oh you, yeah. I only did one commercial in my life, so I guess this is it. Hello, small change, kind of short. Taco Bell, it's just your soul. I'm like, is that Tony Todd out there dancing for a taco? <laughs> <laughs> okay, listen, that was one of my first gigs. I came to Hollywood. You didn't know what to do with me. I said, yeah, I can put your piano down in Venice. But right, <laughs> that commercial ran for a year, okay? All due respect to Taco Bell, okay? But I've never ate a single one of those <laughs> since that day. Because we live in L.A. We got real Mexican food. Yeah. Don't take our indigenous people's food and commercialize it and turn it into some nonsense. But I did commercial some product. It, it, it bought me a, a Tony tel- a Rota at the time. Nice. That was nice commercial work. I, yeah. that I knew that I, I, I made the decision that I cannot sell stuff to people that I don't believe in. And that's what commercials for some actors do. Yeah. And I won't say anybody's tagline, <laughs> but you know. Well, uh, this is the last thing I want to show right here, and uh, this just this just makes me happy. I actually saw this video a while back, and it's you doing karaoke. I think you singing "My Girl." Uh, we need to get up all this stuff. Man. <laughs> Look at you having a good time watching yourself. Yeah, that that like a lot of so fun. Nice. I wish I was there. <laughs> you would have been on stage with me. Come on. Now. Oh hell yeah, I would have been. That was what was this? It was about three years ago at a uh, a horror convention called Days of the Dead. Ah, uh, okay. Kevin was up there. Yeah, E E L is up there. E J. Thank you, man. Yeah, man. Cool. When these conventions get back, I gotta I gotta go to this one. You let me know if you be there, because I want to sing with you on stage. Uh, you know what? Uh, the way it's going this year, I doubt the convention is gonna be able to happen this year. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a sad thing. Yeah, a lot of conventions are not happening, but I really do hope that things start to pick up. I mean, not only just well, for it, yourself. It depends but... on all of us. I mean, yeah. I mean, I know the, 
there's people out there that believe in fake news and and don't believe in science, but this stuff is real, folks. And the sooner that we all play, play, you know, like at the playground, we used to play in the playground, right? You either, mm-hmm. you either got hit by the dodgeball or you threw the dodgeball. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, it was, um, it was great talking to you. I know you got to rest up. I know you got to find Thank your you. wallet. I got to find a wallet because I got to make a store run. But yeah, it's a pleasure. This has been greater than I anticipated. I no longer have that flu bug. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, yeah. Big admirer, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. God bless, man. Hey, you Take too. Take care. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank God you. Bless. Thank you so much for, as usual, watching and listening to what we do here. What a great interview. Had so much to ask the man, but, you know, the man had a lot to say, too, and it was very interesting. You know, you don't get somebody who comes on with that kind of passion. You don't get somebody who comes on who's just ready to take control and talk about whatever's on their mind. Very much appreciate that. You know, my best interviews are where I have a lot prepared, and I don't get to ask even half of them. That means that the other person had plenty to say, and Tony Todd did have plenty to say, and it was wonderful to be able to speak to him can mark that off my list. And, of course, it's always wonderful doing these things for you guys out there. Corey Coleman here, in the middle of the day. I should call this this section, the whole interview section, in the middle of the day, because I keep saying that. But I'm in the middle of the day, done with another great interview. And, once again, thank you. And remember, no matter what, talking about the middle of the day, no matter what time of day or night it is, don't you hesitate to ever try to get a hold of me. You can do so. You've been around, you know how it's done. Kcoolmans at gmail.com. That's K-C-O-O-L-M-A-N-Z at gmail.com. You email us with any kind of questions, comments, compliments, insults, input, and our advice. Hit us up on the social medias, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Copy all that information down right there. Memorize it, love it, but you got to use it. Folks, if you find yourself wanting to come to Austin, Texas, we'd love to have you, but first of all, we ask that just like Tony Todd was talking about. Don't get sick. Avoid the great Omicron. He's out there on the prowl. And give us a heads up. kcoolmans at gmail.com. Let us know what your plans are for Austin, whether you're moving here or you're just simply passing through. We, of course, would love to hang out with you. All right, everybody, that is it. Enjoyed having you here so much. Now we got to go. Thank you. And whenever you're watching or listening to this, goodbye and stay toasty. Like that little sexiness at the end right there.